Ah, uh, no, 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 no. <clears throat> okay, Meg. So we're live. This is our um, Marymount Rules and Law meeting. It's 1.30 on October 8th. So we're going to get started. And our first topic is going to be discussing um, allowing grills, changing our current code to allow grills on balconies under certain circumstances. So Tim, do you want to take it away? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you all for taking the time to uh, help me with this today. Um, just to bring uh, Marcy and Rob up to speed here, Maggie and I were kind of conversing before. Uh, back in uh, 2011 or 12, it was 12 actually, uh, we had an ordinance go into effect to uh, limit people in multi-family unit or dwellings uh, from having grills on their balconies. This origi originated with uh, Windsor Square. That's where we were having some issues of people grilling on their balconies and bringing some concerns forward about, you know, the hazards and life safety issues that, that it put forth. <clears throat> so we had drafted that ordinance back then to basically not allow anyone to grill on their balconies in those structures. And this kind of even includes uh, some of the, the old town square area too. Anything with two or more units in it is technically considered multifamily. And this applies to everywhere within Marymount, Tim? Yes, all within Marymount. <clears throat> uh, this has been brought forward because Windsor Square was really our only building that we were kind of having issues at that time. And since then, the, the condo developments have gone in and, and the newer uh, different hazards have presented themselves. But uh, back then, no one was allowed to have a grill on their balcony. Uh, they could own one and move it about 10 foot away from the building itself to be able to grill. It has to be 10 or more feet away. And some of the discussion that we had is they were considering at that time putting in kind of like a community type grill under a shelter so that we didn't have anyone storing propane cylinders or anything on their balconies. Um, with the last year or two, they changed the state fire code. And as long as uh, multifamily units, those units themselves, if they're uh, equipped with a sprinkler system on the balcony and the natural gas is piped out to the balcony area, uh, the state has now permitted grilling on those types of balconies since they've taken the extra precautions to keep it safe. Um, explaining to Maggie, I'm kind of, personally, I'm a little still leery about it, but we do have people that have invested a lot into their homes in these newer developments and, and paid a lot of money. <clears throat> They've actually paid uh, the developer and the builder to install these features when they were building their particular units. Not every one of the units in these buildings are equipped this way. Uh, so what uh, I was thinking about doing here is changing the wording in this to permit uh, individual occupancies that have the sprinkler system and the natural gas piped out to the balcony being the only ones that are permitted to have grills on their balconies. The rest of this wording would still apply the way that it does if you don't meet those standards. Um, and speaking with Ed is another safety feature. He didn't see a problem with it at the time. As I'd also like to um, put within that, that if they are going to have a grill on their balcony and meet those requirements, that they need to provide a mounted fire extinguisher out there on their balcony in that area also. Um, the reasoning for that is sprinkler systems don't extinguish fires. They help contain them. So if something does get out of hand out there on one of those grills, they would have the ability to grab the extinguisher and try to put it out or at least keep it at a minimum before the fire department could arrive and, and pretty much reduce the hazard of all the other occupants within that building. Um, so the wording itself, I can work on that, I guess. I, I don't know if you need the specific wording today because like I said, I, last time we referred to Ed and he helped Yeah, we us. can just ask Ed. Okay. He'll, he'll be familiar and we can even just probably mirror the state code exactly. And okay. then, I mean, that would be the clearest way to do it. And then in addition, add a sentence requiring a, an extinguisher. Okay. So with this ordinance itself, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar or have read it. Um, down at the uh, 
subsection five there, it says no outdoor wood burning fire pits are permitted on balconies, porches, or patios of multi-unit structures. Um, I was wondering if we could get your guys' approval also to move this forward to put on there basically no outdoor fire pits of any sort because since this was put in place, the propane fire pits have kind of become very popular and that still prevent, pre prevents, presents a, a huge issue should someone want to put one of these out there on their balconies themselves. Okay. So, so Tim, just to be clear, when you say multi-unit dwellings, I mean, is this, would this apply to the row houses on Maple Street, for example, that they're not allowed to have a grill on their porch, even though they have like an outside area? The outside area itself doesn't really apply to them. It could not be on the porch itself. And really none of them have those style porches. Is that, am I making sense? Yeah. It means like a porch with an overhang. So Correct. like they could be on a patio out back, but not like your front. Okay. Porch and then we just got a letter complaining about grills in the front yard. Mm -hmm. are, are, is, there, is there anything in our code that says you can't have a grill in your front yard? This right here would not cover it. Uh, I'm, there may be something else if, if we want to look at adding that in there. I, I, I don't know if those two would, to, would match specifically. That's more of like an um, aesthetic issue, and this is more of a safety issue. Okay. Well, I was just asking because no one, you know. Yeah, I've been down um, the alleys, you know, in, in some of the lanes and such behind some of the uh, properties on Maple and so on. And some people do have grills, but, you know, just at a glance, most of them are the 10 foot or more away from the building itself for safety. Okay. You know, the fire pits down there essentially wouldn't apply either. This is specifically talking about Windsor Square, Miami Road, uh, you know, Madisonville Road, those units themselves, they have those balconies. Right. We don't want any of those on there because one person's actions can affect all of the tenants in that building. And if someone's handicapped, they may not be able to make it out. And sure. So, so Tim, the um, the part about the fire pit is that in a, on a port situation, would that fall under the same criteria that if there was a sprinkler system and the gas was piped out there and there was a wall mounted? Fire extinguisher with that? Because it seems like it's similar to the grill in that sense. It is, but I would I would be against that personally. Um, that draws a lot of concern. You know, they have those going. It's just like a, I had a discussion. What brought this forward was one of the residents in charge of uh, the condo board for one of those buildings itself, you know, was raising some questions about the grills on the balcony because he was familiar with this ordinance. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the... The issue that I have is that I don't know anyone anywhere that would stay with that specific device the entire time that it has a flame, whether it be a grill or a fire pit itself. You know, you're grilling, you're constantly having to run in the house and grab this and grab that and you're back and forth. And at any point, something could get out of control. So I would like to ask with your support that we keep the ordinance or change some of that wording from wood burning to no fire pits on any balcony of any sort whether they meet that state code for the grills or not. The state okay. code, when I read it, does not cover anything about the outdoor fire pits. Okay. So there is one kind of, un well, not unclear, but maybe we should change this too. So we're looking at item number five, where it says no <clears throat> in the ordinance, where it says no outdoor wood burning fire pits are permitted on the balconies, porches, or patios of multi-unit structures. But to Mercy's point, um, should we, I mean, there's a lot of those that have like the little, well, I guess multi, most of the multi-unit structures, the patios are covered. But if we talk about row house style being a multi-family unit, um, the ones that have those patios out back that don't have a cover over them, then you wouldn't be able to have a grill or have a, you know, fire pit there. Is it okay with you if we say covered patios? So we're clear about like the issue that is causing Absolutely. concern is that Absolutely. Or we could just, you know, the 10 foot or more away from the structure itself, um, okay. would, I, I think would be totally sufficient. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to change it to covered patios because 
it gets into, yeah. And then we'll say, and, okay. And on patios must be 10 feet away from the building. Okay. Okay. Well, we're in there making things clearer. Okay. That sounds good. So does anyone have anything else or any other questions on that? No. So do you want to have a vote to go ahead and proceed? Yes. I'm in favor. Anybody else? Yep. I'm fine with the changes we've talked about. Okay. I am, I am as well. Okay. Um, okay. Without, with that, Tim, you are free. I appreciate it. Thank you all for your help. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank day. you for oh, bringing thanks, it up. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I am going to, since I've been scribbling notes this whole time, Rob, since you did the typing up of all this, do you want to run it and I will do notes because sure. we've got a lot and I want to get through it as much as we can. I have to drop off exactly at 2.30. Yeah, um, yeah let's jump into. Okay, so... Okay. So um, I'll, I'll write. Okay, so I, I sent out, um, there's 10 items, 10 different items I sent out um, and I provided discussion and then the actual where the actual um, ordinance language in there. Um, so item one has to do with the temporary yard signs. Um, you know, we talked to Bill, had some changes, some more, some further clarifications and adding a little bit more, um, tightening up about how far out into the yard, I mean, how far wide they can be out into the yard. Hey, Rob, I have a quick question. Sure. I mean, it doesn't specifically say on our agenda we're addressing yard signs. No, we're addressing part, all the changes to the code book. That's, yeah. I don't, but, I, but I just think that would be unclear to somebody who might have, I, I don't know. I just. Well, we did this before. And so I mean, we're following the same procedures we did with the other stuff. And, and again, there'll be a committee report the people can have that can read and stuff like that. So, um, is there? So again, I sent this out in advance. I shared the current language and then the proposed changes. Any comments, suggestions? I did not include anything about the sixty days. I figured let's talk about this part first, and then we can talk about the sixty day. If there's if we want to have a limit on how long they're in the yard separately. Um, shall not be placed. Yeah, I, I'm completely fine with this. I get it. I, we hadn't really thought through, I guess, every possible permutation of where you could put yard signs and how many and all that sort of thing when how many people would try to put out when we discussed this last time we made changes to this um, piece of code. And then we've had discussion and complaints from people since that time. And so this really just tightens it up just a little bit. And I think it's fine. It's useful. It's not overly restrictive. And I'm in favor of it. Marcy, any thoughts? I just, I just would like more notice than a couple hours to be able to like look through these things and think about them. You know, and what especially when on our agenda, it doesn't specifically say that these things are going to be addressed. You know, I read read it when you after we talked. Um, I was doing other stuff this morning and now I'm, you know, I'm looking at it on my phone because I didn't print it out and it's hard to read. And Do you have any issues with this? What it says? Again, all, all it actually clarifies that, again, there was some language in there that I think was not, it was made it confusing. So it just makes it simpler in terms of being back 15 feet. There's only, there's only two changes here, Marcy. It's really not that challenging. It's just. Okay, that really wasn't warranted. Well, it's just, it's, so it's again, all you have to do is it has to be back 15 feet from the curb, unless there's an exception. And then it can't be outside the width of the house. Those are the two changes that are there. Do you have any issues with that? I, I told you what my issue was. I know, but so do you have any issues with the two changes? Uh, 
with the wording changes with respect to this one specific item, no. With it being included today, I think that that wasn't clear that that was going to be on the on the agenda. Okay, understood. Um, and then, so the second part of it was the sixty days. Um, Bill had asked. Bill was talking about wanting to have a limit on how long signs can temporary signs can be in the yard. I I struggle with the how to enforce that. Um, Sounds really tough. Yeah. Again, it, it could create a bunch of work for the for the police to try and have to keep track of every yard sign that's in every yard and how long it's been there. Well, and some people put up like a sports season. I know it's frustrating to have something up forever, but you know, if your kids play in lacrosse and it's a long season or whatever. I don't know what the lacrosse season is. That was a random example, but I mean, I don't know. That's tough to have the police checking on that kind of thing. <clears throat> what does, have you happened to look, cause I didn't Rob, like what does Cincinnati do or? I, I did not. Large, I did. Let's I did. table it and then see how our larger municipality neighbor Cincinnati deals with it and then revisit because that way on the 60 day portion of it yeah with the timing um just because I I can't imagine that there's an expectation for police to have to keep that level of detail on things but it could be like a building commissioner role or it could be like as the inspector runs around doing you know inspections of properties for other reasons maybe that could be something he checks on or she checks on okay to see where it lives and what it what other people have done okay um, it, it is it is possible to do that the, the um the the language you know we had a template for this from the what is it, little miami risk association or something like that so yeah. it is possible to put it in place it just I, again it's more to me how do you enforce it Right. That's and again, like our big thing that we've talked about for the last 18 months has been, let's not have rules that we don't enforce, or we only enforce them on some people when they, you know, aggravate us or something. And that's not fair. So right, right. make one of those. Okay. So we'll check and see what, if Cincinnati or, or any other places have anything. And so you're saying, let's ask chief to check on that or. Um, I mean, yeah, we could, or, you know, I can look up, Ohio, I'll make a note to look up Cincinnati. Um, and then, um, I think as a group, let's like, think about it individually and come again, come back together to see like structurally in our organization, where does that responsibility live? Like, is it, I mean, ultimately, yes, the police would write a ticket for it, but is it the police's job to really drive around and look at that? Or is it something more like the building commissioner who's already looking at who's out of compliance and doing, you know, right? Uh, yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, ideally, right? Like, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that it lives in the police. I think somebody could note to them the same way, you know, um, they get told when people are out of compliance on property issues and they're required to then go visit and talk to them and sub give a citation if necessary. Yeah, but you, it would have to be an official, you need to have, uh, a Marymount official person be the one who's tracking it still. Right. You don't want neighbors tracking on neighbors. No, no, no. I don't mean neighbors. I mean where it lives in our organization. Like, is it the building commissioner? Is it the what is the other role that we had that um, the, inspe the building inspector or something like that that we needed? Um, just where does it? I don't think it's the police. It's not a criminal issue. <laughs> it's just not a police issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, Item two was just as I was looking through on some of the parking issues that was, you know, that was discussed in the finance committee, I came across old language that was in there that made a reference to like the Kroger store that is no longer clearly that's where the strand is now. And um, so there's just two small tweaks. All it is is, we, you know, we're no longer allowing parking from from Miami to to. 20 feet west of Bank Place. That's over here in front of where there's doctor's offices and orthodontist office and stuff like that are. Yep. So you're not allowed to park there. And I guess in the past you could, but so that's, again, our code book is not consistent with um, what's in place now in that sense. And again, we, the Kroger store has been gone for, I don't know, a couple decades. Mm -hmm. So um, just replacing that and just saying the Strand parking lot instead of the Kroger store parking lot. And it's specific that it's the one on Wooster Pike north side so that's clear 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. So this is literally just an administrative change. Yeah. Yeah. It, I don't even know if we need to approve this. It's actually getting our code book in line with what actually the law is. So. And what reality actually is. We don't have a Kroger. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm fine with that. Marcy, any issues with that? No, changing Kroger's is fine. Okay. Um, third item is uh, building commissioner, what the current code says for that. Again, this is a request that Bill has made. Um, we have wording in there that now that says the building commissioner has to be a resident and elector of the village in order to hold the office. And um, I, I agree with Bill that this that puts an undue um, restriction on us because it could be people who are very, very qualified and that would just not make it possible to have that. And also previously, the, the current well, the current language talks about how the appointment it lasts until the mayor, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't exceed the term of the mayor. And, you know, we have now fiscal officer, village solicitor, village engineer. We have a bunch of appointments that we do every other year. And it seems odd to me, and, and again, Bill agrees. It's like, why would why would we make this change when it's change in mayor? You have to go potentially change your building commissioner. So um, this would also get on the same kind of a two year cycle as our other appointed officials that we have. So any questions or concerns about that? No, I think it's fine to make that consistent. And it is going to make it nearly impossible to find someone who can be our building commissioner if we don't start to expand it. Mercy, anything? You know, I just, like I said, I, I just, it, I just don't feel comfortable discussing things that weren't explicitly laid out on the agenda. Okay, got it. Um, Item four, this was actually talked about at the previous meeting we had. So um, if you recall, we had a meeting before and we made a report and Bill asked that we go back and provide better explanation. Um, so this is just providing the explanation. We've actually already reviewed item four and approved item four in a previous meeting. And so- this Yeah, and I think we actually, I think I did submit, I'm looking it up right now, but I think I did submit, there were two items out of like nine that we were fine voting on and moving forward. And I am 99% sure this was one of them and it just somehow didn't go anywhere. Um, but go ahead. Yeah, so again, I'm just, and so again, this was discussed in the previous meeting. This was actually submitted as part of the report. The total report was not accepted. There was just two items out of the report. So this is just trying to, you know, if we're gonna go back and provide an official report with an explanation, this is to help provide that explanation for making this change. But again, we've already discussed this. We've already voted on it in the past. So I think this is just really, again, providing the, the explanation that can go into the meeting notes. I, item five is the same thing too. We did this. We just, we talked about this one before as well. Um, oh, and this one was accepted. I just found my report. So we, they accepted the dog and cat warden. To remove, to remove dog and cat yeah, warden. Yeah, it's already done. So we're done with this one. It just didn't move forward because I think we were going to put everything back through once we discussed the other issues. So yeah, because we haven't, we haven't voted on, you, you're saying, let me make sure I clear, I understand. Item five and item six are things that we, that were part of the report that were accepted by council previously, right? Yes. Yeah, so item five, um, yes, was accepted to remove the following section, dog and cat warden. And I had interviewed chief to make sure we had it all um, covered to make sure, and I have all my notes from that, which I can put in our report, but to make sure that we weren't removing something within that, that we still needed. And he explained how they treat the animals that are found and who takes care of them and basically nothing in our current code is correct based on what happens in real life, so. Okay, so that, that's the dog and cat warden thing. What oh, about sorry. the one yeah. about the, item five is the one about, you know, right, right, now, right, yeah, right now we do not allow um, animals, dogs within in the plot lot area, but right. our code book still says that we do. That's an administrative change, yeah. 
that just wasn't made consistent when we put the ordinance through. So, so five and so, but help me understand something. You, which were which were the ones that did get accepted? But it seems like even they got accepted. If we accepted cat warden, we didn't ever strike it from the. We I know we didn't get it off of here. Um, that was and then. We had talked in that other meeting about um, people riding bicycles on a sidewalk, but when we discussed it, it actually went the other way. We weren't going to make any changes. It was just going to be left up to the, to the discretion of the officers okay. because we don't want to say that nobody can ride bikes on the sidewalks and then have a bunch of kids riding their bikes on the sidewalks technically illegally. So we were just going to leave that up to common sense. But the dog and cat warden um, was accepted to remove it. Yeah, but we we still haven't review, removed it though. I don't think from the code. No, we haven't. I don't think we have. So, but item five still needs to. Be done right. Really. We do. Yep. You're right. We need to make that change. Because again, our our what's in the code is not consistent with what, how we're managing things. Yeah. Um, item seven was one of the ones we met and discussed and voted on before as well. So, um, this is the same stuff that we recommended to council and it just, because we didn't have the backup documentation about explaining why, um, I'm just putting it back out there so we can have that have that discussion element involved. Okay, the blanks and abstentions, is that what you're saying? No, no, wait, are, are we looking at the same thing? I'm looking at item seven. Sorry, you went past four. Are we doing four? Did we skip four? No, we talked four. Okay, I don't have a formal count. I'm sorry, I'm completely, I was reading. Well, no, but see, I, I put numbers at each one of these at the top. See, Bob uh, you know, on the email that I got from you this morning, there's two attachments, but there's no list of numbered items. If um, if you it's in if, green. if you open it, there is. It's it's each. So there, there's there's a ten page document or whatever. At on at the top of each page, it says item one. And if you roll it okay, over. Okay, there you go. Okay, my bad, my bad. So, so that, that's how. That, I'm sorry if I wasn't explaining that up front. That that's when I refer to items, I I numbered them in the document, the word document that I sent out. Okay. So that's those are. I'm sorry, it's not pages. It's actually just the item that I've numbered there. Okay, humor me and go back to number four because I think I want to get a, a roll call on it. Just so it's the one that addresses the Roberts Rules of Order. Talking yes. about, we want to add um, excluding blanks and ex abstentions. Yes. yes. Um, that's literally the only change that we want to make to that piece of legislation. And all it does is bring us into actually working the way Robert's order rules of order work according to the actual book, Robert's rules of order. Somehow. Correct. It was incorrectly in our code book. So a blank and an abstention, you can explain this, but factor factors into the count of people. Today, and that's not consistent with- Right, Robert the way it should orders. be. Right. So, and <clears throat> our, our code book says we're supposed to follow Robert's rules of order. So it's just, again, this is getting, we have two inconsistencies within our code book. We say we're following Robert's rule of orders, but then the, the how we're measuring votes is not consistent with Robert's rules of orders. So this is trying to get the two consistent. Okay. So again, just trying to remove an inconsistency that we have within the code book. Is that me? Maggie, you is that you you wanted to talk for? Is there anything, anything else about fight? No, I just wanted Marcy because she she was kind of scrolling and yeah, you were moving really quick. So okay. Marcy, is it okay? Really, if you go look up this section of Robert's Rules of Order, Rule thirty three, I guess, um, it has the words excluding blanks or abstentions in the Robert's Rules of Order book, whereas our code book somehow just didn't. I don't know if that was intentional but it is incorrect if it was intentional or if it was an omission by accident. So all we're doing is bringing it into compliance so that we're, when we quote Robert's rules of order, we are actually quoting it accurately. So is it okay with you if, are you a yes vote on making that correction? Um, yeah, I am. I mean, we, we talked about this before. Right. Okay. okay, can we go on that? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be so. Right. No, no, if I'm going too fast, that's totally good. Slow me down, I'm totally good with that. So item five, again, this is getting consistency because we talked this before in our previous 
committee meeting and you know all, we recommended to go ahead and make this change because all it's doing is what's currently in the code book is not consistent with how we're managing that area in the top bottom. This the code book says we can allow dogs in the top lot area and there's a sign at the top lot that says no dogs allowed in the top lot area so we need to get the code book consistent with what the signs are that we've put up and at the top lot yeah and i think probably where that originated is you know way back in the day the top lot wasn't fenced right because you couldn't do anything about it back then you know so how are you going to keep a dog out or yeah. in the park but out of the top lot mm -hmm. so are you okay with making that change yes Okay. Cool. Okay. On to six. We've already discussed this. It's already actually been approved by council. If I am, I mean, we can run through it to be sure with them, but I'm pretty sure we already went through this. <coughs> um, getting rid of the dog and cat warden section. Yep. Because we don't have a dog or cat warden formally. And there's, yeah, again, and that, that, I think Ellie would have an issue. No. She, she just wants to, she wants to be the dog and cat warden. That's what I say. Yeah, yeah but yeah. she never applied. So I don't think we've had a staffed dog or cat warden position in I don't know how many years. Not since I've lived here. The only time I've ever seen a dog catcher is in cartoons. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so item seven, this is one we discussed previously as well. And we had approved and submitted to council. Um, this is adding two items to the rules of council and it's assigning items to the committee. You know, right now it's just, we're saying items will be assigned, the, the additions would say items shall be assigned to the committees by the mayor with the consent of council. Items can also be moved from one committee to another by the mayor, again, with the consent of council. Um, and then the other one is any special committees or commissions created by the village should be voted on and approved by council. The charter should also be created, laying out clear responsibilities, deliverables, and any desired timelines. Any commission committees or commission commissions that are temporary should be called out as such. So those are again, we, we discussed these before, we approved these before. It's just resubmitting them to, to council to vote on. Okay, item eight we discussed before. It was one of the items we voted on and approved and presented to council. So this is just, again, providing the background explanation for the change. Um, so oh, the motion, okay, hang on. Marcy, for number seven, back when we were talking about adding those two items about moving things from committee, like putting something into a committee and or moving something from one committee to another or forming a special commission or count or committee or commission. Are you a yes on that one? Well, I, have, I, have a, I just have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Does this mean something necessarily has to be approved by council? Because like, for example, when Kelly wanted to take, to give me back the CRA, she just said, can I give you back the CRA? And I said, fine. Well, but then, um, you know, the mayor had to say, okay. And 99% of the time, I mean, we would always have to ask him because now the way it's written, the mayor has to say, okay. And he is technically the person. That's why whenever I want something in my committee or somebody does, we're like, hey, Bill, will you please bless this and put it in my committee? Um, so it's basically, yes. I mean, that had to happen anyway. It just happened. But it doesn't necessarily have to be voted on by all of council to make that change. Currently, it does not. Correct. Currently, it does not. And I don't see a lot of times where there would be an issue where you'd get stuck with something in your committee. This was more um, to stop the committee shopping. From the previous administration. Like more like, I know that this person runs this committee and they're going to do whatever I ask them to do. So I'm going to put it in that committee when half of council is saying that's not the person with the expertise, that's not the right committee and it's not going to be done, <clears throat> you know, the right way. So what specific change are you, uh, I guess I'm. I'm... So if you, if you see um, in the, so I put the original 
different rules of, of council and then the, the proposed change. Uh -huh. and seven, seven and eight are the new additions. If you can see those on your, on your phone. Yeah, so we're adding a seven and eight. Before there's only six. Um, but I thought that number seven was actually called out someplace else and we were taking it away from there and moving it to here. I'll have to double check that. Because <clears throat> it does talk about the mayor's ability to place something into committee at some point. And I think what we did is move it because we were talking about that with Ed. Where does this belong? I don't have my whole list of rules of council with me. I should. If a motion is required to put in writing that it can be done right then and there. Oh, you're, you're actually, Mercy, you're, you're reading um, number like eight. eight. Yeah, yeah that's eight. We're, we're talking about seven right now, just FYI. And really, honestly, number eight, I mean, if you're really on the ball, it doesn't say you can't do that. It's just that I don't play by those rules. Like, I don't do all the things that something says I can't not do. It's more just to help people realize, like, if, if you want, if somebody's going to require you to write something down, it doesn't mean you have to wait till the next meeting to present your idea. It just means you have to scratch it out so that we can give it to Joni. Or someday when Joni retires, whoever Joni is replaced by. So you're saying you want to do a formal vote on this? Yeah, seven and eight separately. Seven, I mean, is just, seven is just assigning things to committee. Eight is any special right. commission. So yeah. two different things actually. Well, okay, sorry. Yeah, seven and eight in the in item seven, we'll vote on together. I'm I'm fine with it. So we're voting on both together, or we're just voting on seven, and then we're voting on eight. So no, we have for item seven, which uh -huh. is adding those two new rules of council. That's getting really, really confusing because they are rules number seven and eight. Yeah. Vote on those together. So items shall be assigned to committees by the mayor with the consent of council. Items right. can also be moved. Blah blah. Hey, then, I just want to make sure I understand what I'm agreeing to. Yeah, and then the I don't feel like I got adequate time to prep. Okay. So number eight that we're voting on with seven is any special committees or commissions created by the village shall be voted on and approved by council. A charter shall also, also be created, blah, blah. So those two we're voting on together. I'm fine with those two changes. Rob, are you fine with those two changes? Yes, I am. Okay. <clears throat> and Mercy, if you have any other questions, we can talk about that. No, it's okay. Okay. Then item number eight, sorry, I got super confusing is another rules of council, it's rule 25. So Marcy, going back in the history of things, you can, the mayor can ask you, like if you bring up something and you want to make a motion. On I don't it. have a problem with this one. It, I don't no, either. Okay, it's just- not, That makes sense. It's clarification. It's, okay. Rob, you're fine with this one, right? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm just documenting because we have so many issues. I'm going to document the, all the votes separately in case we ever differ and we need to talk about it. Okay, number nine. Okay. Number nine, again, this is where um, Ed is confirmed and he sent the response back to all of council that yes, Mar because Marymount is a statutory village, Marymount has to follow Ohio Revised Code, Ohio, Ohio Revised Code said that we have to follow the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And we've had issues in the past where council members, especially newer council members, weren't even aware. I mean, Maggie, you were part of this when, when yep. this happened before that council didn't even know that this Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices existed um, and that it should be referenced when, when any kind of changes are being proposed for traffic control devices. So. All this is doing is it is helping to provide guidance 
for council if there's any kind of um, installing or modifying a traffic control device, just helping to tell council, hey, make sure it complies with Ohio Manual of Traf Uniform Traffic Control Devices, because by law, we have to. We have to comply with that. So, so this is just a preamble. And when I talked to Ed about this, he said, putting in a preamble before this section would be probably the best way to, to do this. So this is following Ed's advice about where to, where to put this in to help, help guide council so that we make sure we're following the law. So it's not really a change at all. It's just a clarification. Yeah, it's, again, it's, it's just, it's a preamble that's providing guidance. <laughs> we're not creating new laws with this thing at all. We're just helping to point council to where they need to go look and make sure that we are meeting, or we are complying with law. Any questions? Nope. Okay, so you wanna have an official vote okay. on that one then too? I'm fine with this. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, Mercy, how are you? Um, I'm just going to abstain on this one because I personally would have liked more than an hour or so notice to, to really read it and think about it and understand what, what you know, the couple of these things we, we went back on to be re-looked at. So that's where I am on this one. Okay. Okay. okay so item 10, Rob, I'm going to let you introduce it. And then I have been thinking about this because I was there for the whole thing. And I want to give just for you and Marcy, what the, uh, I don't know what the context was for what happened. Um, mm -hmm. And then we can decide what to do about it. So, yeah, so, so, so this goes back to an ordinance was passed as an emergency measure um, <clears throat> back in July 18th of 2016. And I've included here the email from Ed that went with the ordinance where Ed says, and we've actually talked this in council too. Mm -hmm. Um, where Ed said, and I provided the quote there, frankly, ordinances such as this are oftentimes considered vague and overbroad, so they may not survive a constitutional challenge. Um, and it's, but it's th this, this, this law, and, and Ed, Ed actually says here, I, um, we can certainly fine tune it at a later date if you would like, and, and we never have. And so we continue to have a rule on the book that our, Village solicitors has said would is likely not to survive a constitutional challenge. So, to me, e either we remove it or we fix it. But it's just it continues to sit there, and it's just nothing's being been done about this. Um, and and if we have a law that's on the book that we can't enforce, why do we have it on the books? It just doesn't make sense to me. So, with that as background, Maggie, do you want to go ahead and? Okay. Is that the temper? Is that the temper? Is that the teardown one? No, it's no. to do with um, <clears throat> like well here that you'll you'll make it'll make sense. So, it really had to do with um, I think the straw that broke the camel's back was the four houses over on Beach that American Heritage did. Yeah. Um. So they had been doing work throughout the village here and there. Um. And it was you know nobody had a whole lot of trouble with it. Um. But I think. So when they bought those homes, those are just outside the boundary of the historic district. And he did it very intentionally because he didn't want to have to go through all of the, you know, filing and working with the ARB and it was going to be a lot more expensive. So he did it for cost reasons, which as a business person was a smart idea. But what he built was not satisfactory to the people who live over there because it right. doesn't at all look like, and he wasn't required to, to be fair, I know. outside of the historic district. But um, so anyway, there was, there was much dismay in the community, especially the places over near there. And so it was, it came to council to discuss. And so, um, so not to throw Bill under the bus, but he was the guy leading the committee that had to do this. So he worked really hard to try to 
come up with the, like some aesthetic guidance. Um, and like he and I talked about it a lot. I know Dennis worked on it a lot and there is just not a lot you can say that doesn't start to get over into like the area of taste. Like you can't legislate taste. You can't, um, it's not the historic district. I suppose we could change the boundaries of the historic district. There's a couple ways to go about it. Um, but Dan was kind of pressuring us, you know, look before they buy a bunch more houses or even worse, like four or five in a row and do this someplace else where obviously we know that the citizens are not happy with this, but we cannot legally prevent a business from going in and buying homes and redoing them because that's their job and that's their business. And so, um, and they're selling. So that was kind of the pressure. Um, no, I'm aware of that because Maggie, if you remember, I supplied that the paper copy of that to you. Yeah. When you're talking about the teardown aesthetics, just to give you a history of what we do have in place. Yeah. And so, and that is the kind of the point in time where the teardown aesthetics then became a separate issue. And then this, this aesthetic character thing kind of peeled off of it at that point, because we at least had something in place. And while it probably wouldn't stand up to a court challenge, my assumption was, you know, well, at least we have it on the books and it's not going to be worth somebody's time and money to take us to court over it. I think is kind of where it was left. This is temporary. We know it's temporary. We're going to do better, but then, you know, other fires started and we never did better. And so, um, my sincere belief is, you know, I don't think we should pull this out of our code book because we don't have anything at all. If we do that. Well, I do think we should get to business and get this taken care of in well, the community where it belongs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and we, you know, and here's where we are and I haven't updated you with the whole, you know, if you remember from the teardown aesthetics, you know, we, I, I, we MPF broke that into two parts. Yeah. You know, there, there's just, just right now we, we discussed in my committee, the demolition ordinance. Right. And per Joe's request. Um, I sent, we MPF, MPF and I met together and we sent it out to a couple realtors and, to spin and Weber and where we are right now on that is, um, is that two of the realtors got back to us. One of them never did. And then spin and Weber had some more questions and we tried to clarify them and we haven't heard back. So I need to press on that little piece and get that done. And then we were going to move into the specifics of the aesthetics that um, MPF like was recommending. Building. Yeah, like for and for new there, building it, for it, and there is a lot, I guess. I mean, and I may have been pressing Bill about this. Is there is a lot of case law where municipalities apparently have won when they are trying to kind of keep a style consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, I keep asking Bill, well, you know, then show it to me, show it to me, show it to me. So, okay. I guess I think this is being addressed, albeit more slowly because of COVID than I would have liked. Um, and I, you know, as far as the demolition stuff, I'm going to press to get those answers this week so we can try to meet next week on at least go on that, but um, or in the in the next several weeks, whenever. But um, like I said, Spen and Weber had some questions, so I I guess I at this point I don't feel comfortable getting rid of this. I do feel like it does need clarification and I feel like that clarification is, is coming. That's fine. That's fine. So I, I'm fine with that then if, if, if you guys think, cause again, my, I just, I have personal frustration cause we've talked to some council prior to you joining Marcy and, um, and it's been on the books since 2016. And, and I understand, I, I totally get what Maggie said about, why it was passed so quickly. And, and I think there was an intention to come and address it. At least Ed, Ed even volunteers to go fix it and yeah. fine tune it is what he said. Um, I mean, none of us, to be fair, like when we took the vote, we were all squirming in our chairs. We didn't want to do it this way. We didn't feel comfortable. I don't think anybody did, but when it was put to us, like, here's the deal, we can have nothing and we can lose more houses and have things put up that we don't like or we can make it a real pain for somebody to do, like to take us to court for enforcing it and they're not gonna spend that money. It was a discomfort. I mean, it was it was gross. It was a politi politician moment, but it happened. And so now we need to do better, but yeah, cause, we cause can't this, repeal this. this. 
this the thing that really bothers me about this current law is the way it is written it says any change to the outside of a house yep. has to be reviewed and and by the building commissioner and viewed as being aesthetically consistent with the rest of the and and I know I've talked to Don about this. He doesn't want to be in that position of trying to sit there and say, does this, this? And, it, and again, it can be as little as something as like putting a flower box in your front or whatever, because the way this is currently written is just, and that's why Ed said it's so overbroad and general. Mm-hmm. That's the issue here is because it is just so, I yeah, mean, it covers everything. Every little change you want to make to the outside of your house. It is, to- but at the end of the day, this doesn't belong in rules and law either. I mean, taking it out, I mean, if it were totally terribly unconstitutional and we were applying laws, you know, in a prejudiced way against people, then we would just pull it. But the um, the reality of it is it's not that and it doesn't belong in rules and law. Can, can we can we put something in the committee report just you know supporting Marcy's work that she's trying to yep. do in there and say say you know we just recognize the fact that this has been on the book since 2016 and our our village solicitor has given us his advice that this is not constitutional and so we really need to fix this uh-huh and again help provide Marcy whatever support she feels like in yep. terms of getting things through her committee then yep. Okay, so Rob, I'm looking at this on my phone. So I apologize because I can't really read it very well. Um, and like I said, I skimmed it after we talked. Mm-hmm. But do you have specific changes you want to make in here? I mean, because I'm looking at my phone, everything's the same color. Wow. And I, can't, I can't switch to, yeah. you know. So are you, are you talking about item 10 now? Yeah, on? item 10. Specific yeah, no, it, all, there was no, all I was, all I said was, I actually proposed just to strike this from the from the code book because again it's not enforceable and it's, well, it's overly broad. But I, I agree with what Maggie said. It's like okay, as long as as long as we give it the attention and, and give you the support you need to get this stuff done so that we do address this this outage. That's the thing that I well, I'm and, 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 you know, and I, I I do want to recognize it is a really really sticky issue. Sure, sure. Uh, Bill yeah. shared with me. So Bill, Bill and I have talked about this because Bill shared with me all the research he did, and it, it was it is a ton of stuff. But again, goes. again, this isn't explicitly on the agenda. You know, the agenda says updates to the code language. I'll give you that one because that's something we revisited. Clarification regarding grills, yes. Recodification of the code book, and then parking. So this specific item isn't even listed. So we're going to go ahead and we're not going to recommend that, but we're going to go ahead and make some comment about how, um, you know. Yeah, I'm writing it right now. Mm -hmm. In their work to update. And it's, it's a hard, I don't know what the answer is, you know. Oh, no, I agree. But that's that's why MPF worked with that consultant to kind of come up with, with, because you want to maintain the character and quality, but you don't want to be overly burdensome. Right. right, right. And again, right now, what's what's currently on here is just not, you can't apply it. We're, we're not applying it. Let's be really honest. We're, we're not. We're not applying this law. I mean, if somebody did something, uh, yeah, I don't even know. It would be an after the fact, which then what's the point, right? Right. Okay, okay so we have, um, go ahead. Do you want to talk codification now? Yeah, we have six minutes for this. Um, so Marcy, I don't know if you've been through any of this, because I know you come to a lot of council meetings, but this kind of always happens real quietly. So way back, I think it was 2013, maybe 2012, we did what we call recodifying. It has nothing to do with making new code or anything. It just make it, it's taking all of the ordinances that we have made since the last time we recodified and taking the pieces of paper that Joni slides into her paper binder and sending them to this company. We've used American legal in the past. Um, and we basically give them our current, like old outdated code book, along with all those pieces of paper and where they go. Including like that one that we just said that, built, that, that Rob wants to get rid of because remember it's not in the code book. It just exists on a piece of paper yeah. separate. Okay. Yeah. All that. So yes. And so that's the, so this is the drawback of doing it once every 13 to 15 years. It's like, 
if you go online, you look up something, you are likely reading something that has been changed. So our citizenry is not able to access updated things. Um, you know, people who come to do construction here look up our code book. They do that as a rule and they look at it and they're looking at something that might not be real or it might be outdated. Um, and even asking Joni to go hunt something up, like I have to, before I make any changes, I always double check with her. Hey, have we changed this? And I just forgot. And there have been times where she's like, yeah, you already did that. <laughs> so um, I just, I went to look it up and it, I looked it up online and it wasn't there. So in the past, we, um, so we fold all that together. What happens is the process is I contact a lady that works there and I tell her we're Marymont, we're ready to do this. They are familiar with us. We have an account. They know what our, they have our old code book. They're the ones that gave us the online version. And she will give us a menu of things that we can do um, and various prices. So like we can do it only online. We can get a bunch of printed out copies. Um, they last time I talked to them and this is, I'm sure this has evolved since then, but they had some sort of rolling deal where you could get only online, but update it every two years. Like, so they would fold your, fold your stuff in for you every two years. And it was way less expensive but it was like an ongoing thing. Um, and at that time, you know, everybody still wanted a paper copy. We had to have a paper copy for Joni because mainly because she slides all this stuff into it. Um, Dan wanted a paper copy and people were still a little funny about tr only having a, um, like a PDF version. Um, and now I think we've evolved where I think, you know, like I'm fine not having a paper copy. If people want a paper copy, they can get them. The company makes them really expensive because I think they don't, they realize people are moving away and it's a pretty big deal for them to print all this. So what we'll do is we'll get this menu from them. We'll call a date like, Hey, you know, this is where we're cutting off. Everything that happened before this date is going to American legal. Everything that happens after this date is not. Um, and then what it takes them quite a while because we have amassed a lot of junk in the last 14 years. Um, and they roll it all up and they give it to us. They do a consistency check. They make sure it's legal. They reference the Ohio revised code back and forth to make sure that hasn't changed. And they will make those changes in our code book. And then they send us back a copy. We are responsible for reviewing it. And then I sign a paper as the head of this committee. And then we're off and running and it takes them however long it takes them to print out the number of copies that we need and get it all together and send us the PDF and let us post it on our website. So that's the process. Um, we were gonna do it last year and we decided for budgetary reasons to push it. And we think that, I think Tony said that the, the CARES money will help us pay for this. So that's why we're a go, even though we're in the middle of this weird time. And, and then going forward, we, 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 Joni has said going forward, we really should do this on an annual basis. The cost will not be as much if we go ahead and keep more up to date on this stuff. Right, I mean, it was, in 2012 or 13, it was like $8,000 or $15,000. I don't know. It was pretty expensive, but then they were like, you know, guys, if you did this every two years, it would be considerably cheaper. And so Dan was like, well, I'd rather pay it a bunch every so often than, you know, every single year. But I think, you know, now that people are really accessing code online and I think it makes sense to give them updated code and us too. Well, how much does it cost? Well, we'll find out because I'm sure prices oh. have changed. Um, it's going to be in the ten so, to fifty thousand dollar range. So, what I guess, what is your specific question proposal about recovery? I'm not really. Pro I'm just letting you guys know we're gonna. I'm gonna make that call and get them. So you'll be in the conversation about like when they send us this menu, we'll talk more about. Okay. What we want, and Joni's a big piece of that, too. So this is just more informational type stuff. Yeah. I just want to let you know. Okay. So when I send you this, you're not like, what is this? <clears throat> so, okay. Well, with that, it's 2.30, so. Yep. All right. Thanks. Okay. Mike. Sorry. I got to mean, I got to run to. So sorry about that having to leave, but thank you. Thanks for setting all up. Thanks. See you later. Bye.